Living in the Alaskan bush. That's the uh, topic of this video. And uh, for any of you guys who have ever been curious about moving to Alaska, living in Alaska, have thought about it, are currently thinking about it, uh, this is a data sheet that you may find helpful. So we're going to be discussing things like the weather, the gear you'll need, um, a hat, which I guess kind of goes along with gear, uh, flights there, uh, hair, infrastructure, money, banking, food, hunting and fishing, women, and just giving you kind of final thoughts on what it's like living in the Alaska bush. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into this. Um, living in the Alaska bush. I had been working the cubicle grind for a couple years, but always dreamed of going to Alaska. I wanted to experience another way of life, experience adventure on the edge of civilization, and experience the unknown. Alaska is a huge place, and it can be very different from one region to the next. Most of my time has been spent in the Arctic in an area only accessible by small plane. It is a life-changing experience, and you will become a different person. Uh, this, this video is basically intended to be a general overview of what it's like. Uh, some areas like hunting and fishing would require a separate and more detailed post. Uh, so I'll try to keep things kind of as general as possible. So uh, first off, weather. In the Arctic, you have eight months of winter and four months of no summer. <laughs> In the summer, there might be a week of really hot weather, but for the most part, you will always be wearing a sweatshirt. There's very little rain. Uh, the American Southwest gets more rain than up here, just to give you kind of an idea. Uh, in the summer, you get uh, days with 24 hours of sunlight, and this can make it hard to sleep. So you need to buy blackout curtains. Uh, your body doesn't get tired and keeps telling you to go, go, go until you hit a wall and crash to sleep. Uh, you have a year's worth of experiences and activities in the summer because there's so much to do outdoors. In the winter, everything is frozen solid, and it gets cold. Uh, it's amazing life even survived up here and continues to survive up here. It can hit negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit and gets even colder with the wind chill. Uh, with some wind, it can hit minus 100. Uh, it feels like hell, a <laughs> cold hell, and I tell people it feels like being poked by tiny needles. Uh, the constant darkness can beat you down and make you depressed uh, and try to take lots of D3 to make up for the lack of sunlight. Um, they make pills, or you could even buy a sunlight uh, for inside of your house. Although living in the bush, uh, power can be uh, short to come by as well, so uh, the D3 pills are probably your best option. Uh, the only advantage of the darkness is that it's really easy to sleep during these months. So uh, next, we'll be talking about gear. Uh, you will need to upgrade your war. Ugh, you need to upgrade your wardrobe to survive the cold. Everything is function over style. You can get through the summer with pretty much anything, but you need to prepare for winter, and winter is always around the corner. Uh, and one thing you'll notice is in Alaska, every month that's not winter is essentially preparing for winter. Uh, the key to keeping warm in the winter is to layer, layer, and layer some more. Uh, you'll need a good coat. The most common coat uh, that I see is a Canada Goose brand. Uh, they'll keep you warm. They do cost around $600. Uh, I wanted something custom made to fit me, so I went with an apop apocalypse design in Fairbanks. Uh, it's a tiny store, but their coats are the best you can get for the extreme cold, and it is expensive, about $700. Uh, you feel like a giant marshmallow walking around in it, but you will not be cold. Uh, I use my apoc uh, apocalypse coat for extreme trips, and will be outside for more than an hour. Uh, if it's less than that, I have a lighter Columbia jacket that works fine for short bursts outside. Uh, you'll also need a pair of bibs, or overalls as people call them. Everybody has Carhartt Extremes in Arctic quilt bibs. Uh, order a couple sizes too big because you're always going to be wearing layers and you need to be able to fit inside of it. Uh, for boots, uh, most people wear some form of muck or bunny boots. I could never find bunny boots <clears throat> that could fit me, so I went with the most extreme Baffin boots I could find. However, they were too heavy, so I went with the Muck Muck, muck Boot Company and got the Arctic Pro. Uh, they're awesome at keeping your feet warm, but not very comfortable for long walks. Uh, they rub the back of your foot raw, so they're not comfortable, but they will keep you warm. And when it's not as cold outside, so say around minus 20 or so, I go with the winter's shoes made by a company called Merrill. Uh, they keep you warm, and it's nice for when you go, uh, you know, when you're going around driving in vehicles and need to actually be able to feel the pedals. Uh, for your hands, you're definitely going to need to get a high-quality pair of mittens. Uh, gloves won't work. They need to be mittens. Um, I don't know what the science is behind it, but your hands will be warmer inside a pair of mittens than gloves. I think it's because your fingers um, aren't all separated where, you know, they're being exposed by heat at all the different uh, points. You know, when they're in one mitten, your hands can kind of keep each other warm and they kind of circulate the heat inside the glove. Uh, you can, however, get some light gloves to wear under the mittens. And you'll, you'll wear mittens for the uh, quick walks outside or going to and from different buildings or places. Uh, but if you're ice fishing, driving a dog team, riding a snow machine, hunting, trapping, etc., you'll really want uh, to upgrade to a giant pair of uh, 
of moose or beaver hide mittens. These are going to be about 400 bucks. Uh, you get them in the village from an old lady who sews. They're huge and they'll make you look like you're walking Bigfoot, but they will keep you warm in the most extreme conditions, uh, especially if you wear in combination with thin gloves underneath and throw, it, throw in a hand warmer. Um, that may sound extreme, but you really need it. It will actually get too hot with the hand warmer in there, but I'd uh, rather be too hot than too cold. Uh, next is a hat. A uh, hat is one important thing. Uh, you're going to need to get a fur hat. Commercial materials do not even come close to competing in this arena. It has to cover your ears, the top of your head, and down your forehead. Uh, to an outsider, you'll look kind of funny. Uh, you'll have that kind of 1680s stylish uh, hunter-trapper look going on, uh, but you will be able to stay warm. Uh, fur will also keep you dry. It stops the wind. Uh, I've been going through an awful week-long rainstorm uh, before winter, and my head stayed warm. Um... You know, even though you look like you're wearing a, a wet cat on your head, you will be warm. Uh, to compare, I went outside one time in a windstorm with commercial gear on. With commercial gear, I mean like mass-produced, like Columbia-type stuff. And within a few minutes, I had to go back in because my head was burning from the cold. I switched into my fur hat, and I was fine. Uh, for all those who are against using animals for fur, you probably live in a warm climate uh, because it's a necessity, uh, a necessity here. Uh, the key places to shop for clothes and gear in Fair Fairbanks. Uh, my favorite is a store called Prospector's. There's another store called Big Rays and another one called Beaver Sports. Uh, none of these places sells furs. You have to get fur in the village or stop at one of the fur shops in town. Uh, as far as flights out to Alaska, um, let's switch the picture here, give you guys something else to look at. Uh, travel can be very complicated, and depending on where you're at, you may have to take two different flights just to get from village uh, to the village into Fairbanks or Anchorage. Uh, some of the airlines that service the villages do not have updated websites, and it can be really kind of difficult to plan out your trip. Uh, without going and talking to someone on the ground. Also, the flight schedule and flight times can be somewhat unpredictable, so you need to be ready at a moment's notice to run to the airstrip. Uh, the planes don't wait for you, and they will leave you behind. I've seen people stranded because their flight came a couple hours early, and they had no idea. Uh, there may be only one flight a day to your village and nothing on the weekends, and if there's inclement weather, you may get no flights at all for a short period. You know, could be as long as a week or two. Uh, total travel time from where you live in the lower 48 states uh, will be probably around a day and a half or two days each way. Uh, most likely with a, a hotel layover, and in many cases, your flight out of the village to Anchorage or Fairbanks will cost you more than your flight to the lower 48. Uh, connections will never match up, and you will have awful departing times or arrival times. Uh, most flights out of Alaska dump into SeaTac, uh, so that will be your, your jumping board to anywhere else in the world. Uh, another tip for small airplanes, bring earplugs. Uh, you will slowly damage your hearing if you fly around a lot in small planes and don't wear earplugs. If you're going to be flying into the village from the Fairbanks hub and have to stay overnight, I always say it, stay at Sophie's Station or Pike's. Uh, Pike's has, has more of a lodge feel to it, uh, but so Sophie's Station has a 24-hour shuttle and is right next to Fred Meyer, so you can stock up on food. Uh, from about September 15th to May 15th is w the winter rate, uh, which is around $80 a night. In the summer, the rates are significantly higher, you know, $160 or more. Uh, I'm not as familiar with Anchorage, but I do know it's more expensive for hotels compared to Fairbanks, and it has a shorter winter rate window. Uh, hair. It's like the uh, the big rocker hair of the 1980s never went out of style here, and it's culturally acceptable for men to have long hair, and besides, there won't be anyone to cut your hair, so you might as well grow it out. Uh, you did come up here to be a mountain man, right? So, you know, hair, beard, uh, don't worry about being well-groomed. Uh, in terms of infrastructure... Uh, there's not a lot out here. Uh, the, here we're looking at kind of a weather map of, of Alaska just to give you an idea how things can get. But there's not a lot out here in the villages. The airport will be a gravel landing strip at the edge of the village. Uh, there will be some trail, trails and gravel roads. That's it. No hotels, no gyms, no bus lines, no taxis, and nowhere to eat. You're completely on your own. Uh, if, you have an, if you have employer housing available, it'll take care of your problems, but you can have a comfortable existence. Uh, some places have limited cell phone coverage or no coverage at all, and if you're really lucky, you might be able to get some internet. Uh, internet in the bush is satellite-based, it's slow, and it's expensive. So uh, you'll disconnect and unplug from the world. The villages have deal, diesel or biomass generators for power generation, uh, but you can expect frequent power, out, uh, power outages uh, at the worst possible times. Uh, some villages have running water, uh, many don't. Uh, if you're in a village that does not have running water, it will be a very difficult experience. Uh, people will not shower every day and will wear the same outfit for days at a time. Uh, if you have running water and don't have to use an outhouse at negative 60, you'll feel like you are living a life of luxury. So don't get used to being comfortable here. Uh, in terms of money, nobody comes to Alaska because they love the weather. They come for the opportunities. 
the outdoors and the freedom and or the money. Uh, the major job opportunities in the villages are government or administration jobs, a uh, school teacher, which actually has high wages great and great health insurance um, and a pretty average pension, a uh, health care provider, uh, high demand, especially in rural areas, uh, public safety or technical trade like a, a mechanic, an electrician, etc. Um, it is very difficult to find a good job, qualified people to work in the bush, uh, but even then, most employers in Alaska want to hire someone with Alaskan experience. Uh, I've seen lots of people from the outside that come up with romanticized views of, of you know, what it's going to be like, and they typically don't last very long. Um, so just, you know, basically having been there for a while and proven that you lasted is kind of a big point to employers. Uh, if you can get accepted beforehand, that's going to be rough and really shitty, um, but you'll be able to survive. Um, in the village experience, if the village experience isn't your thing, you can always find a job in a tourist or coastal fishing industry. Um, I'm pretty far away from the coast and not in a tourist area, so I really can't comment too much on those. Um, many people in the villages work on the North Slope in the oil industry. They make great money and work two weeks on and two weeks off. But with the downturn, uh, there have been a lot of layoffs. Uh, however, there is also a lot of turnover, so that means there's always a job opening up. Uh, most of the oil jobs are based in Prudhoe Bay or Anchorage, uh, and a good website to uh, um, to check, um, to narrow down your search is uh, go to alexis, A-L-E-X-S-Y-S dot D-O-L dot Alaska dot gov backslash default dot A-S-P-X. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is banking. Um, so banking, you'll be stepping back 50 years. Everything is cash-based. Uh, I always carry at least two grand on me. I also bring small bills, ones, fives, and tens, uh, ten dollar denominations. Uh, if you don't have exact change and you're buying something, you'll never get your money back. Uh, it's similar to if you've ever traveled to like the Caribbean. I run into the same thing in like Jamaica and a lot of places. People just don't have the money to make change. Um, it's not like you can just run out to the bank and oh, you know, give me a roll of quarters and a and hundred ones or whatever. Uh, the village store may accept credit debit cards if the phone line's working. If it's not, they won't. Uh, nobody takes checks because there's no easy way to cash checks out here. Um, Moving on to food, uh, Alaskan is a league of its own when it comes to the cost of food. Uh, you're at the end of the line, so your food selection is pretty limited, and the food that's available is not fresh unless it's like meat or fish. Uh, if you're really lucky, the village store, if you even have a village store, might carry a small selection of vegetables, uh, but most of the smaller places only sell junk food, canned food, soda pop, and cigarettes. Uh, the prices are, are just simply prohibitive. A bag of walnuts is $40, uh, half a melon is $16, a head of cabbage is ten dollars. An apple is three bucks. Uh, I've never had cabbage in my life, and now that that's all I eat because it's really the only uh, fairly affordable vegetable. Uh, if you have internet, you can order dried fruits from Amazon and have it shipped to the post office. If you require regular food and a food selection, you can do a bush order from Fred Meyer. They'll box up some food, get it on a plane, and get it sent out to the village. But again, it's expensive. Uh, I've never done a bush order because I didn't want to deal with the hassle. Uh, you have to meet the plane at the landing strip. If you're not there, the box will be left on the ground and the plane will leave. And then anyone in the village can walk off with it. Uh, as far as hunting and fishing, that's what you really need to, to do. Uh, both these require their own detailed post, but I'll give you kind of a general one here. I use a gun and one type of bullet. Otherwise, the logistics of keeping your own private armor, armory will be too much. Uh, I settle for a 30-odd 30 30 odd six with 180 grain bullets. Uh, I use the same gun, same type of ammo for everything, regardless of if it's a beaver, a bear, or a moose. Uh, you don't want to have to check your scope just because you are switching to a different bullet grain, so it's easier just to keep it consistent. Uh, most guns in a bush are open sight, uh, iron sight, uh, because of the reliability. Uh, scopes can break or fog up, especially in this climate. And uh, bring all your ammo with you, too. You won't be able to buy what you need in a village. For duck or goose and uh, small game hunting, you'll want to use a pump-action 12-gauge. Uh, don't bring an auto root loader. Uh, it'll just simply get jammed up in the field. Uh, after one year, you become a resident for hunting and fishing purposes. For most other states, uh, the time frame is six months. Uh, also, once you hit the one-year mark in a rural area, special subsistence, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> hunting and fishing rights will be open for you. Uh, you'll need to find a local to take you hunting as you won't have the gear or the knowledge to hunt in the bush as an outsider. Uh, there are certain cultural boundaries you need to respect. And if you're hunting with a local, you'll be accepted and people will open up to you. In many places in the lower 48, hunting is a hobby or a weekend activity. Uh, but up here in the Alaskan bush, it is a way of life. Uh, I never fished up here with a rod and reel, and I've never seen locals fishing like that either. Uh, there's no such thing as leisure, fi leisure fishing or catch and release. It's catch and keep. Um, 
most of the uh, native fishing is done using nets or fish wheels. Um, you, you know, if you watch uh, shows like uh, Alaskan Bush People or uh, I forget some of the other ones, but you, you've probably seen what I mean by that. Uh, you can be the most educated person in the world, but you'll feel like a dumbass for the first time. Uh, you, tr you try to set a giant tangled net from the boat in the swift river. Uh, and after a few times, you'll start to feel like MacGyver as you tie things off and set knots and are constantly improvising with whatever resources you have around you. And that's really a necessity in Alaska is improvising and working with what you have because it's so hard to get materials. Uh, you should buy a book about how to tie knots and practice. Uh, most people can hardly tie their own shoes. Uh, you'll use a lot of different knots for setting up camp, hanging meat, drying fish, setting a net, tying off a boat to a dock. So it's really good to have a knot for any situation that comes up. Okay, so we just touched on uh, hunting and fishing, and like I said, that was very brief as hunting and fishing, you know, it could take years to, to learn everything you need to know, but that's kind of everything in a nutshell there. Uh, something else you guys may be wondering about is women. Uh, this is one of the major drawbacks of not only Alaska, but even more so the bush. Uh, I've seen a few gems, but uh, smoking and drinking takes a heavy toll. Uh, it's a hard life in Alaska, and I've seen some messed up stuff go on. Uh, the women are fighters and are generally pretty ornery. Uh, and I've even seen the women beat up the men. Uh, there isn't a really a culture of marriage up here. You see a lot of cohabitation. Uh, they start having kids young, and it's it's not really a thing for men to drop out of the picture before a child's even born. Uh, you see a lot of intergenerational living, um, where you know basically grandparents are taking care of the children and grandchildren. And when you fly back into town, you'll have serious beer goggles on for every woman who looks attractive, even if she's not, uh, because in a bush, it's uh, it's rough. Uh, final thoughts on living in a bush. Uh, the bush is an experience that most definitely is not for everyone. Uh, you have to be get, be comfortable and get comfortable with being uncomfortable, if that makes any sense. Uh, life in a bush is survival oriented and nothing else really matters. You know, it's not about style. It's not about uh, material things. It's about getting by and not dying, basically. Uh, you get by with less and you go without luxuries. Uh, you make some good friends, but everyone's a little bit crazy. Uh, you learn patience, and uh, little things no longer uh, upset you. Uh, you see food as a valuable possession, and it's something that takes a lot of time and effort to obtain. Uh, you know, it's not like you can run out of McDonald's and grab a burger. Like, you have to kill, cook, skin, eat, and prepare everything that you do. Uh, you learn how to hunt and, and how to take care of your meat. Uh, you have no choice but to learn how to cook. Uh, you learn independence, survival skills, and how to rely on yourself. Uh, you learn what it means to be part of a real community um, and be bound together by physical isolation. So, you know, whereas back at home, you don't really need other people. You need other people in Alaska. And also because the communities are so small, there's much more of a community feel. Uh, you'll develop a taste for strange foods that people back home would think you're crazy for eating. Um, if the bush is too much for you, you could always try for, you know, one of the pipeline or oil field jobs or try to find something in one of the major cities where you can have a more, quote unquote, normal life and still have the last frontier, you know, right at your doorstep. Um but that is uh, Alaska and living in the bush in a nutshell. So if you guys have any questions, comments, or, or want to share your own experiences, feel free to do so in the description box below. If you enjoyed this, uh, this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed, please click that subscribe button below. And uh, check back for more videos. I'm going to be sharing some more uh, data sheets and more interesting stuff on Alaska and other experiences. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next video.